Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about my um, second published book on its um, 10th birthday. I can't believe 10 years have come and gone by already and this is based, going to be based off of the blog post which I was just um, published today talking about this like you know amazing um, tin anniversary. I have a separate video from a couple of years ago. I'm obviously not going to rehash everything in that video. I'll link to it at the end of this video talking about the general background of this book, my um, writing process, the editing, how I got the idea, the general um, synopsis of changes that were made from the discontinued original horrible um, first draft that was like a Grimm's fairy tale and acid, all that, you know, fun jazz. So you guys can go um, check out that video if you would like. This is just going to be talking about my, you know, general reflections on this book. And I'll also be um, showing you guys the original hand um, drawn cover I did for it. I'm so glad that is no longer the cover of like any of the editions of this book that should never have you know seen the light of day. After two and a half inspiration fueled months of writing a 397,000 word first draft years after thinking I had forever lost the unfinished original version. Thank God that version, you know, was lost for so long I could never have, you know, written a half decent story around that Grimm's fairy tale on acid and a good three years of editing. I released Little Ragdoll into the world on the 20th of June 2014. I chose that date because it was the 50th birthday of the song whose story inspired my own story all the way back in 93. And if you guys you just don't know about it, you're not into classic rock and pop and all that fun stuff. It's was the Four Seasons song Ragdoll, which came out obviously like the 20th of June 1964. I would at the age of 13 when I first heard that song and heard um, Bob Gaudio, the main um, songwriter and the keyboardist pianist for the Four Seasons, talking about what inspired him. A young girl was washing his windows at a very long red light in Hell's Kitchen, and he couldn't find the change to give her when the light changed, so he gave her a $20 bill instead, and he, she, he just always remembered the look on her face. Uh, wow, this kind stranger in a nice car gave me 20 bucks just for watching his washing his windshield as he drove off to the recording studio, and he just couldn't get that girl out of his mind and he wrote this like lovely song about her and I was just kind of obsessed from the time I heard this story at 13 you know I wanted to write a whole novel based around that when the the poor girl you know gets her happy ever after with the rich boy but there's of course like a lot a lot of sturm on drawing along the way to you know getting their happy ever after but anyway like you know that song it was like it set basically everything in motion the four seasons were my second musical love like they were my favorite band through much of um, 1993 and early 1994. I went back to the book in January and February 2017 to create a second edition that was very much needed. No major changes were made, but I made the writing a lot stronger by rooting out overused words and phrases. For example, but not, oh, this is not an exclusive, exhaustive list by any means, even, which was like probably the, the most overused word for myself back in the day. I did not even realize how many times I was massively overusing this word in my drafts and other words ever. You know, I mean, yet, I guess, actually, apparently, now, at least, you know, all those sorts of weasel words you almost never really need. I also changed passive language into active language, for example, saying, oh, a character feels like you know, sad or scared and this person is sad or scared or whatever, or changing ing contractions into, you know, this person is doing this or this person does this. This book is written in the present tense. I, have, I, I don't remember if I did a video on why I was inspired to use like present tense in general, but I do know I mentioned why I use present tense tense for this book and my um, first Russian historical, You Cannot Kill a Swan, in those two respective videos. I was basically inspired by um, Ida Voss's, um, I think it was her first published book, um, Hide and Seek. I think it was published in 1978. Obviously, I wasn't reading it bec then because I wasn't born then. I read it in, um, sometime in 1992. I don't remember when exactly. And it was a revelation to me to discover books could be written in the, the present tense. It just made everything feel so like immediate, like right in the very moment. You don't know what's going to happen next. Obviously, this is years and years and years before every other writer, particularly YA and now middle grade too, like jumped in it. Ooh, writing YA and middle grade. Got to do first person te present tense, no matter what. And of course, it's first person present tense. I do um, third person present tense. And it, for me, it was a carefully considered decision. I wasn't mindlessly following a trend. And I just, you know, genuinely cannot picture these characters in these two, like, respective, like, family sagas of mine existing in past tense, even though, like, 99% of everything else I 
right isn't the classic default of you know past tense but anyway I just I just, it just feels so right for the story if I tried to imagine it in past tense it just it would feel like completely different alien it just you know needs to be in present tense and I do realize you need to have a lot of practice in the classic default of past tense before you start doing into present tense and I, I was only 13 when I started these two books but by that point I had you know had a had had a lot of practice in writing past tense already and yeah that is something I'm going to do a future video about in more detail you know that choosing the perfect tense for writing and such and finally I removed pointless rehashings of established information cluttery chat an obnoxious preachiness that was so obviously me pushing my own point of view. I believe I went into this a little bit in the video talking about the general and background of this book, and I've definitely talked about this in my five-part series on my um, blog, like Lessons Learned from Post-Publication Polishing. I also mentioned my um, other, my first unpublished book, and Jakob Flew the Fiend Away in that series it's just like general things like oh I'm looking back and changing these things not making any huge changes to the general story or like cutting out massive like word count or anything like that it's just like ways to tighten up the writing a little bit and realizing oh I was doing cluttery chat this is a really pointless like who cares this conversation doesn't really advance character development or any of the storylines or it's just me, oh, I'm talking about, it was really stupid for Capitol Records in the U.S. to repackage the Beatles um, albums from the British originals. Like, I mean, of course, that was really sneaky and like, you know, capitalist greed trying to milk more money out of these um, millions of young fans by you know, making them buy records, more records than they would be buying if they just, you know, put them out as the Beatles issued them. But like, why are they having this conversation at this particular time? That's kind of inappropriate. And there was a whole long scene when they're, um, driving back to um, um not Glens Falls and Hudson Falls and up, up, upstate New York and um Adisha and her brother Alan and his wife Lenore they're like picking up their their sister um Ernestine and her friends the four Ryan siblings who live by Ernestine from you know they're going to Vassar College and there's basically this long thing like Ernestine and her best friend Deirdre are talking well Deirdre is the one doing all the talking I know this is kind of off topic but I was you know talking of, this is a particular example of things that were just like obnoxious point of view or just cluttery chat she's talking oh I my little sister opened the door to some Mormon missionaries and they it was just horrible and this ranting about like Mormon theology is really weird and creepy in their history and like Joe Smith was like a horrible person yeah I mean I, I stand 100% by those views but I mean it wasn't so much I didn't want to risk offending potential Mormon readers it was just like why is that in here how is that advancing anything yeah it's an interesting conversation but it doesn't really have much to do with you know anything uh, like and so many other examples like particularly the natural childbirth yeah there are a number of midwife births in the book but I really like to think my um point of view is like choices in childbirth not you know only one particular way and it was basically this whole long historical lecture of twilight sleep was absolutely horrible and this is why it happened and this is why natural childbirth is you know raw 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 the only way you should do it and obviously that was an attachment parenting there was a lot of you know preachy dialogue and narrative about that too and that obviously that all had to go it's not that I don't you know stand by those views or at least if I don't feel exactly the same way today 10 years later at least you know I have the same general feelings on those on most of those issues but it just like why is that in the book it just seems like preachy instead of like a natural genuine part of the narrative or that dialogue advancing anything the second edition also received a new cover designed by a friend in my local writing group well I'm still proud of the original hand-drawn cover as a piece of art in its own right particularly because it was very helpful to me in learning how to draw more realistic human figures, something which I have long struggled with. So basically human figures wasn't something I had a lot of experience with. I'm, you know, glad I got that practice, even if they were at like a fairly smaller scale instead of like a full life, full sized still life. But again, that really wasn't ready for prime time or at all. And it no way belonged on a published book. And I'll just um, show you guys in my um sketch pad. I drew this at um, 14 inches by 17 inches. So this is the artwork which I worked on in the spring of 2014. I used um, mostly um, colored pencils and um, wax, um, water soluble um, wax pastels from a bunch of whole, a whole bunch of different brands. I have a blog post talking about the art materials I used with that. I mean, it's not really bad. I wouldn't consider it like totally amateurish. I, even now that I've you know started to try to 
improve my human figures, I still like to draw deliberately, you know, more flat and um, cartoon-like human figures. But again, this doesn't really look professional. Yeah, it's great for my own personal portfolio and like improving, you know, how I draw human figures and just a scene in general. But it just, look at this, it doesn't look very professional. Like would, if you saw that on a book in the bookstore, would you immediately think, oh, I've got to have this. Look at this. I'm wonderfully judging a book by its beautiful, professional, lovely, serious cover. You're going to think, oh, wow, it's an amateurish hack. The story must be, you know, absolute garbage. And I, I, again, it, it's not really bad. I don't consider it, you know, bad artwork for what it is. But again, not really belonging on a book. And this is supposed to be um, Adisha, the um, well, um, this is all backwards, the one in blue right there looking sad. I'm next to her and the green is her um, sister-in-law, Lenore, like her signature color is, um, her signature color is green. Um, Adisha's um, signature color and favorite color is dark blue. That's her little sister, Justine, whose signature color is pink. That's um, Justine's stuffed bunny someone gives her at the Bowery Mission in um, Easter 1960, when she's, I think, 13 months old or so, and she carries that bunny around with her, you know, everywhere. It's her velveteen rabbit, and behind them is um, Adisha's um, other next favorite sister, Ernestine, who's like two years older than she is, and Ernestine's signature color is red, and that's um, their brother, Alan, who is uh, the second of the three boys in the family. There's nine children total, and he's the only um, good um, Troy brother. Like, you know, oh, the, uh, I mean, there's so many, like, things I could tell you about all these characters. I had so much fun, you know, like, going through the journey of life with them and you know, watching them grow up. And every time I reread the book, I love, you know, going through the journey with them all over again, particularly like, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but it's just so fun to see the character development as they go through more of life. And anyway, um, Alan and Lenore, they live in a, a blue um, five-story apartment building in the West Village. It's like it was more built around 1950 or so, and it's really thrilling because it has an actual, you know, elevator in it, so the girls don't have to go up and down stairs all the time. And that just kind of looks kind of like the one of the, is this the Swedish flag colors? I know it's the colors of the Ukrainian flag, but it kind of looks like the Swedish flag. I believe the Swedish flag uses these colors. So anyway, let's just um, continue talking about my reflections. As I've said so many times, there are a lot of things about this book I can't change without a full gut renovation that would require way too much time and effort. But again, like, why would I go back when this book is in the past? I can, you know, revisit it every so often, still be proud of it. But it's just, you know, why would I waste time, take time away from other things I'm working on and just other things in general I'm doing in my life just to you know, try to reach perfection with a book that's, you know, came together the way it did, obviously. When I went back to that story of my heart after almost 16 and a half years, and I had even begun dreaming about this book in the months and weeks leading up to it, so, you know, I knew it was time and a number of details, like, I had long since forgotten. They totally came back to me during these dreams, like the character of Sara, who's the exploited, severely underpaid, uh, underpaid nanny to Adisha and her siblings, and a number of other details. It's just like, wow, my, I never really forgot that they were lurking in my mind, and like, dream world, they just like, came back to me. So that was basically like the universe and God and the divine just telling me it's time to go back to it. And so anyway, when I went back to it, I was still quite new to the concept of deliberately writing and polishing towards publication instead of just like basically doing, you know, whatever I felt like. And oh, editing isn't really that important. Just like write new material or write around bad material instead of taking out the bad material entirely or just, you know, radically rewriting it. Thus, certain things are intrinsically baked into the fabric of the book and just really can't be changed. While I no longer use that obnoxious, outdated God mode, oh, that is such an obnoxious style of narration. By the time I return to the story, and if you don't know, God mode is, for example, telling the reader how to think and feel. Oh, oh, the stupid woman continued down the street and not realizing or paying attention to, oh, she was about to step in elephant dung or slip on a puddle because she was just an idiot not looking at her surroundings. Or they make moral judgments on characters or spoiling future events. Oh, as Amy looked through the bridal magazine at the age of 15 and dreamt about marrying her boyfriend Josh as soon as they graduated high school, little did she know she, would go, she was going to die in a car accident on the way to the wedding and would never be in that beautiful dress and have the beautiful reception. So, yeah, thanks for spoiling everything. And that's really how I used to write. And I, I picked it up from so many of the older books I had read and they used that style. I just didn't know like literary conventions had 
by and large moved on. So, you know, I was just like innocently copying what I knew and what I had seen modeled. And it did take a long while for me to start developing past that and come into more of my own style that was more in line with, you know, modern conventions and literary styles while still being true to my, you know, intrinsic voice. I totally own the fact that in certain ways, my writing voice and style will always be, you know, more old fashioned, but you know, there's some things you can't entirely change, but I do like to think I've, you know, evolved sufficiently with the times and, you know, played the best of both worlds. And so anyway, when I returned to the story, my narration style was still a bit too distantly omniscient. As I've said in a previous blog post, it was more like a distant camera taking turns instead of staying in one person's point of view for an entire scene. And I realize some people think, oh, that's head hopping. And maybe I guess you could say a little bit, but it's not like I was jumping, jumping back and forth with, oh, now this person's point of view. Oh, in the next sentence, person number two. And oh, and here comes person number three and person number four. And let's jump back to person number one and three and two and five and eight and 11 again. It's, you know, it was more just, I, I mean, I could just show you some examples, but it was just more like I wasn't staying just in one person's point of view. It was just not close perspective like writers are taught to do like these days. I don't think close, tight point of view will ever be my style, despite how popular and encouraged it is today. But I try to adhere much more closely to something resembling it now instead of, for example, over relying on emotional adverbs or passively describing how someone feels. And I believe I've touched on it in past videos. I definitely have described it in blog posts, like writing like emotions. That's just something that still doesn't really come naturally to me. And it feels kind of fake when I look back on and Jakob flew the fiend away because I was just trying to write too much to market in modern like, contemporary sensibilities. There are also a lot of wraparound narrative segments I could have expanded into full detailed scenes or chapters in their own right. Sometimes a wraparound narrative segment is necessary to not slow the story down and only deliver the most important facts about a certain episode or period of time, or for example, just briefly describe what happened between each chapters, like, oh, since the last chapter, oh, the characters have gone to a different hotel or a beach house, and that, okay, and you can just continue the story instead of, like, belaboring the point and showing all that stuff happening, but... Anyway, there were just so many opportunities to enhance overall character development and story development with things like, for example, Emmeline's high school graduation and Gemma's university graduation, which both happened in 1966. However, I did manage to cut almost 22,000 words during the second edition edits, so I obviously did something right. In comparison, I put a few thousand words in during second draft ed edits, almost all of which involved correcting my shocking omission of any left-handed characters. That's one of my trademarks in every story. I made Adisha, Alan, Ernestine, Emmeline, Justine, Lenore, all four Ryan siblings, Ricky, Irene, and Amelia Southpaws. And Irene and Amelia are the daughters of Alan and Lenore, and some of the other children of the second generation, including Alan and Lenore's son Oliver, are Southpaws too, but they're so young by the time the story ends, you can't, it wasn't really possible for me to show them favoring their left hand, but they definitely emerge as Southpaws in the long um, hiatus um, second and um, third books in this family saga. Despite my regrets about some of the choices I made, or being unable to shake my long ingrained old-fashioned narrative style, I feel this particular structure works for the story instead of against it. I didn't do this deliberately, not having read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn before I wrote the first draft, but Little Ragdoll does feel very much like a 60s and early 70s version of Tree, which, where, um, if you haven't read it, um, many of the, the passages and events and such are told in a more, like, telly, like, emotionally distant way, but they don't feel emotionally distant at all, even though it's more like, you know, act passively telling instead of actively depicting in detail and it just like works so beautifully for that book and a uh, little ragdoll definitely feels like that in certain places as well. It's also structured so the language and situations gradually become more mature and complex as Adisha ages. From December 2020 to July 2021, I went back and did some more light edits for a third edition as part of preparing and formatting it for a hardcover edition, and that, um, the hardcover edition, which I haven't yet got my own copy of, it's about a hundred pages, um, longer than this, not because I added lots of new material, I, I, I think I took a little bit out, but obviously not too much to, like, impact the overall, like, you know, the spine size, it was, it, the page count increased because I made the inner margins, um, one inch, they, as originally published in the paperback edition, and that margin size is unchanged as, um, point, 
seven inches and I just realized it, it's it's readable but it even though it is getting a little bit uncomfortably tight by the end but it just needed to be so much more like inner margin size and I still do have a future video planned about you know trim size for both on readers and writers. This wasn't nearly as extensive as the second edition edits but I did add a few new lines and passages here and there and wrote different ending lines. The actual ending is unchanged but I wanted the final line to call back to the first line just as the final line of the last episode of As the World Turns hearkened back to the opening line of the first episode, the opening line was, uh, good morning, dear, and the final line was, good night. The entire structure of the story as I crafted it would collapse if I radically edited it for a fourth edition. It has the inherent voice and style it does, for better or worse. I might not recognize it any other way, and it wouldn't be developed and plotted as strongly. I believe very strongly that every book comes together in exactly the way it was meant to, and that creating it in just such a way only comes this way once in a writer's life, and then never again. The general outline and story idea might still be there at a later date, but the book wouldn't be written in the form it was meant to take, and I really don't think I could write it nearly as well if I were just like going back from scratch in memory like right now instead of versus in um, November of 2010 through February of 2011. Destiny dictated I write Little Ragdoll just the way I did, just as Ricky loves Adisha, just the way she is. And obviously that's calling back to the line of the song with the, you know, the chorus line, I love you just the way you are. So thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. And um, please um, consider leaving me a comment. Like, is there any book you have ever written that you like put on hiatus and then came back to after many, many years or have you like heard about similar stories if you're not a writer yourself but you're just a reader or just anything in general that this um discussion reminded you of and please consider subscribing if you haven't already i will see you guys again very soon thanks again for watching bye